Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about what's happening in the Russian economy and specifically to talk about the $300 billion worth of Russian assets that have been frozen ever since Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, these assets relate to all of Russia's cash that was sitting in overseas banks and institutions at the time that it decided to launch the invasion. And almost immediately after news of the war broke out, those assets were frozen by the financial institutions that are holding them, and they've been sitting in a state of limbo ever since for more than two years. However, things are now starting to heat up and there is a potential that those frozen assets might start to thaw because we've now got proposals put forward by the European Union, the UK and the USA in terms of what should be happening with that cash. So in today's video, I'll have a brief look at the details of the assets themselves, where they're actually sitting and what that cash has been invested into. We'll then talk about the European Union's latest proposal, which is to take the profit element of those assets and use that to fund Ukraine, to actually enable Ukraine to buy weaponry with the money. We'll then talk about what the USA and the UK are proposing because they've come up with a completely different concept. They're talking about issuing what's called either a freedom bond or a reparation bond, whereby the full amount of the assets that have been frozen that Russia has will be issued in the form of a bond. And those bonds will only have to be repaid upon Russia giving over a huge amount of cash to Ukraine to repair all of the damage that they've caused. So I'll go through the details of exactly what the UK and the USA are proposing and how much that would actually equate to. We'll then talk about what Russia's response to these ideas has been. And as you might imagine, President Putin is not very happy with the concept of somebody taking his $300 billion worth of assets. And Russia is now threatening retaliation. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen to these frozen assets over the course of the next three to six months and what the impact of that will be on the Russian economy. But before we get started, once again, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone that's supporting the channel. If you've bought me a coffee or sent me a YouTube super thanks, thank you so much for the time and effort that you've taken to do that. I really appreciate it. And if you've signed up as a long-term supporter of the channel, either through Patreon or YouTube membership or buy me a coffee membership, really appreciate that long-term support. It motivates me to post more videos. So thank you so much. And if you'd like to support the channel in a different way, I'm offering this guy. So let me reach back just to prove that this isn't a green screen. I've had a few emails recently saying, I don't like your green screen. Can you change it? This isn't a green screen. This is actually real world. And this guy, which is Stiltman, which uh, let me get into perspective. This guy I'm now offering up as a prize. So if you're interested in winning this original Joe Blog statue, check out the video at the end of today's video or have a look in the link below. On the 24th of February 2022, which was the day that Russia commenced its invasion of Ukraine, Russia had total overseas currency and gold reserves of $612 billion. And out of that figure, around $300 billion was held in cash and securities in overseas institutions. Now, one of the first things that happened in terms of the sanctions being applied against Russia was that Russia was cut off from the financial systems. So it no longer had access to the SWIFT payment system and banks that were holding assets on behalf of the Russian state were told to freeze those assets and not allow Russia to move them and take all of that cash out of those accounts. And the reason that Russia was holding around $300 billion worth of cash in overseas accounts was because of all of the trade that Russia was doing with all of the counterpart countries. So basically, when countries were doing trade with Russia, rather than remitting all of the cash directly to Moscow, they were sending it to bank accounts that Moscow had set up in various countries around the world. And this made things much easier to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. But obviously, from Russia's point of view, the risk was that that cash was sitting overseas. And in the event that it decided to invade one of its neighbors, there was a potential that all of that cash could be seized. And obviously, that's exactly what's happened. So let's have a look at a breakdown of exactly what Russia was holding at that point. At the time of the invasion, Russia's central bank was holding around $207 billion in euro assets in Europe, $67 billion in US dollar assets, and $37 billion in British pound assets. It also had holdings of $36 billion in Japanese yen in Japan, $19 billion in Canadian dollars in Canada, 
6 billion in Australian dollars in Australia, 1.8 billion dollars in Singapore dollars, and Swiss franc holdings in Switzerland of around 1 billion dollars. So as we've just seen, European financial institutions are currently sitting on around $210 billion worth of cash that Russia deposited with them before the invasion of Ukraine. Now, if you know anything about the financial system, you'll know that money makes money. If a financial institution is sitting on $200 billion, it doesn't just lock it away in the safe and do nothing with it. It can lend that money to other institutions. That's how the world of finance works. If you've got more money than you need, you lend it to somebody who needs that money and they pay you some interest when they give you it back. And it's estimated that that $210 billion worth of cash is throwing off between three and a half and four billion dollars worth of profit every single year. So over the last two years since the invasion started, that money will have thrown off between seven and eight billion dollars worth of profit. And the European Union is now honing in on that profit and saying that it can be used to fund the war in Ukraine. The European Union has proposed taking 90% of the revenues generated by Russia's frozen assets and transferring them to an EU-run fund that finances weapons for Ukraine. Josep Borrell, the EU's foreign policy chief, proposed that the remaining 10% of the seized revenues go into the EU's central budget, which cannot be used to buy weapons, to boost the defence capacity of Ukrainian industry. Under the plan, proceeds from the assets, such as interest payments, would go to the European Peace Facility, an off-budget fund that provides military aid to countries outside the EU and has been used mainly for Ukraine. A senior EU official said last week that the frozen Russian assets are likely to generate between 15 and 20 billion euros in after-tax profits until 2027. European officials initially discussed using the proceeds from the frozen assets to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine, but in recent weeks they've increasingly focused on how to help Ukraine militarily as Kyiv's ammunition-starved forces struggle to hold back Russia's invasion while a major US military aid package is stuck in the US Congress. A senior EU official said, We are in a more dire situation, so the delivery of weapons is even more important. Burrell said that some members of the EU have voiced concerns about legal issues and others about the effect on the financial markets but he said the European Central Bank had been closely consulted as EU staff developed the proposal. On top of the profits generated from the frozen assets, Ukraine will also receive each year the 25% tax that the Belgian government puts on the profits. For 2024, this is expected to be around 1.7 billion euros, so the total financial contribution for Ukraine from frozen assets in the EU will therefore be somewhere between 4 and 4.5 billion euros. Once the proposal is approved by EU governments, the profits will be set aside for Ukraine twice a year, with the first tranche being available in July 2024. The Russian assets are currently held by EU Central Securities depositories, mainly Belgium's Euroclear, which will keep 3% for operational expenses and temporarily retain 10% of the profits as a safeguard against legal action by Russia. European Commission Executive Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis said Russia was being held to account for the massive damage it had caused. Our proposal will redirect substantial windfall revenues from frozen Russian state assets for the benefit of Ukraine and its people, he said. The EU proposal does not envisage for now the confiscation of the capital of the Russian assets only the use of the profits they generate. However, Ukraine's Prime Minister has called for the EU to go one step further and confiscate the capital itself. We insist on the full confiscation or other use of all frozen assets. Europe and the world needs an effective precedent for making the aggressor pay a heavy price for the destruction it has caused in Ukraine, he told a news conference in Brussels. So I think this is quite interesting because what the European Union is proposing is that they don't want to touch the frozen assets. They see that as a step too far, actually taking Russia's cash. But what they're happy to do is skim off all of the profit that those assets is generating. And that's really quite an interesting idea because if you've got money in the bank, if you put your money into your bank and it's generating interest, that interest will be added to your account. If your bank suddenly turned around and said, actually, we're going to keep all of that interest because we've decided that we'd quite like to do that. You'd have a legitimate claim against your bank to say, hang on a minute, I gave you my money. There is a cost for that. You're giving me some interest 
and therefore I'm entitled to be paid it. You can't just take that. It's basically the same as taking some of my capital. So what the European Union is proposing here is slightly contradictory. They're saying, well, we can't touch the assets because we don't own them. They belong to Russia, so we don't want to cross that line. But actually, we're quite happy to take all of the interest that's being generated by those assets. But surely it's the same cash because that asset appreciates in value. That's what happens when you put $210 billion into a financial institution. It will grow through interest that's added to it. So skimming off the interest is essentially the same as taking some of the capital. If you think about the impact of inflation, each year inflation goes up and it reduces the purchasing power of your cash. But by putting your money into an interest-bearing account, hopefully that offsets the impact of inflation. That's how it works. So the real value of your money doesn't fall by the full amount of inflation. It only falls by the difference between inflation and the interest that you're being paid. So in terms of looking at the logic and the rationale behind the EU's proposal, it doesn't really make that much sense. Either they're saying that these assets are frozen and we're going to take some of them and give them to Ukraine to help it in its defense against Russia, or you're saying they're completely offside, we can't touch any of these assets because they belong to Russia. But what the EU has actually done is come up with a hybrid proposal whereby they're taking some of the asset, albeit it's the interest that's being generated by those assets, and taking that and giving it to Ukraine, which I think is a really interesting concept and potentially opens up a world of legal action against all of these financial institutions. And these institutions have now come out and said that they're very concerned about the EU's proposal. So what we're talking about here is legislation that's being agreed at the top level by the EU. But in terms of what's going to happen in reality on the ground, the banks that are holding onto that cash are the ones that are going to have to hand it over to the EU. And they are potentially then open to legal action in the future if Russia wants to bring them to the High Court. Two far more radical plans have been put forward by the USA and the UK in terms of what should be done with the frozen Russian assets. The USA has proposed issuing a $50 billion bond that is linked directly to the $300 billion worth of assets that have been frozen. So basically the way this would work, a bond would be issued called either a freedom bond or a reparation bond, so meaning the repair of, relating to Ukraine. So that money would be raised from investors. So you would have 50 billion that would be invested by various governments from around the world. And that 50 billion would then be given to Ukraine to buy weaponry to support itself in its defense against Russia. So that would effectively be the funding that President Zelensky has been calling for because Ukraine are currently under pressure right now. They need as much cash as possible because they're running short in terms of what's happening on the battlefield. Now, in terms of how that bond Bond would work, it wouldn't actually be collateralized directly by the assets that have been frozen. So it wouldn't have full security. You wouldn't be able to sell those assets directly to repay all of the bondholders. But the proposal is that the interest that's being earned off those assets could be used to actually pay the coupon on the bond. So if you've issued a $50 billion bond, it might have a coupon of 5% attaching to it. So each year you would need to pay $2.5 billion to all of those bondholders to give them their return. So in order to fund that, you would need to take $2.5 billion from the interest that's being earned on the frozen assets and give that to all of the bondholders. But in terms of how you actually repay that bond, the proposal is that the bond would be linked to a damage payment that is made payable from Russia to Ukraine after the war ends. So basically the bond would be issued in perpetuity, so it wouldn't have an expiry date and only would become repayable if Russia hands over a large amount of cash to Ukraine, which Ukraine could then use to repay the bond. And the bond itself would have some form of link to the frozen assets. So basically the frozen assets wouldn't be available to be released back to Russia until Russia had made this payment to Ukraine in reparation of all of the damage. So in reality, the only way that the bond would ever get repaid is if Russia agrees to hand over more than 50 billion to Ukraine to repay it. If Russia never does that, 
then the bond would never be repaid, but also the frozen assets would never be released. So you'd have a circular situation here where the only way that Russia could get access to its $300 billion worth of assets would be by repaying the bond that Ukraine had taken out to fund its defense against Russia. So a slightly complicated situation, but quite a clever way of being able to realize some of the asset value that's currently frozen. Now, it's only $50 billion that's been proposed by the USA so far, but if this idea was to be taken up by all of the governments of Europe and the West, then there is obviously the potential that you could add to that bond. You could raise another $50 billion at some point down the road if the initial funding had run out and Ukraine needed more money. So this is quite an interesting way of all of the governments from the West actually giving money to Ukraine, but not doing it directly at the moment all of the money is being handed over as aid. So basically, they're giving the money to Ukraine and they will never get it back. It's just a gift. But by setting up this bond idea, what you're doing is effectively setting up a loan. So the governments are loaning the money to Ukraine and in the event that they get a large amount of cash from Russia in the future, then they could repay all of those governments, which I think is probably a better long-term proposal in terms of if this war is to go on for five or 10 years, then it's going to be a really big ask for governments around the world to keep giving more and more aid to Ukraine on an unlimited basis. Now, in terms of the proposal from the UK, it's very similar. David Cameron, who was previously the Prime Minister but resigned after the Brexit vote and is now the Foreign Secretary for the UK, put forward a proposal on the 6th of March stating that the UK would be willing to loan Ukraine funds matching the amount of Russia's frozen assets in the UK, which are sitting at around 32 billion euros or around 37 billion dollars, and suggested that the frozen funds could be considered as collateral as part part of the loan process. So this proposal from the UK is going one step further than the USA's idea and actually securing the loan against the frozen assets. So having a direct link between the loan that's being given by the UK government to Ukraine and those frozen assets from Russia. So basically the UK government would get repaid when those frozen assets were sold. They would just take all of that cash and repay the debt. Now, as you might imagine, Russia is not very happy about the idea that their frozen assets might be used to provide loans to Ukraine or even taking the interest that those frozen assets is generating at the moment and using that to help Ukraine. When asked about the EU's proposal to use the interest being generated from the assets to fund weaponry for Ukraine, Maria Zakharova, spokeswoman for the Russian Foreign Ministry, said... It is simple banditry and theft and went on to say that Russia would retaliate if the West went ahead with confiscating Russian assets. The Kremlin has said that the EU's plan, if implemented, would destroy Europe's reputation as a reliable guardian of property rights and lead to years of litigation. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said, Europeans are well aware of the damage such decisions can do to their economy, their image and their reputation as reliable, so to speak, guarantors of the inviolability of property. The damage will be inevitable. The persons who will be involved in making such decisions, the states that will decide this, of course will become objects of prosecution for many decades. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think what happens with Russia's frozen assets is absolutely fascinating and is a big topic. We're talking about $300 billion worth of assets. This would dwarf the amounts that have been given to Ukraine so far in terms of helping it to defend itself against Russia. And let's not forget that this war has been going on for more than two years. So this topic has actually been on the agenda for more than two years. And it's only now that we're getting to the sharp end that people are starting to make decisions. And you might be sitting there thinking, why has it taken two years? Why are we only talking about this today? And the reason for that is because of the funding problems that are happening right now in terms of all of the aid that's being given to Ukraine. Over the last two years, Ukraine has received tens of billions of dollars worth of support. But unfortunately, the war doesn't look like ending anytime soon. So we're now getting to the state where this looks like being unlimited support. We don't know when the end is going to come. And that's one of the reasons why the latest funding package from the USA is taking so long to approve, because it hasn't had sign off from the Senate. And of course, let's not forget that this is an election year in the USA. We've got a presidential election coming up 
in November. And if there is a change of president, then there is a possibility that there could be a change of approach. And we don't know whether or not Ukraine is going to continue receiving large amounts of funding from the USA. So the governments around the world need to think up other ways of getting money to Ukraine. So I think this is why this has become such a hot topic right now, because we've got $300 billion worth of cash just sitting there that could be used to help Ukraine. But what we've heard from the EU is that they don't want to touch those assets. They don't think that it's legal for them to actually seize the cash and give it away. But what they're happy to do is take the interest off the top, so the profit that's being generated from those assets. But as we discussed earlier in the video, is there really a legal difference between the assets themselves and the interest that those assets is generating? Because from a legal point of view, either you own those assets or you don't. This is like owning a property, but then being told that you're not entitled to any of the revenue that's generated by that property from renting it out. It doesn't really make sense. But for whatever reason, the EU has decided that it's going to go only after the income. It's not interested in trying to get hold of the assets. And Russia has responded by saying that this is theft and that they are going to take legal action against all of the institutions that are involved in this. And this is now causing a high degree of nervousness amongst all of those financial institutions. So we've got a classic situation where the policymakers are saying one thing's going to happen and then the people on the ground who actually have to go ahead and deal with that are very worried about their own situation. So it will be interesting to see whether or not the EU does approve this legislation and if we get to see some of that cash actually moving into that fund in July as proposed or whether it's held up by some form of legal action. Now, in terms of the proposals put forward by both the USA and the UK, they are far more radical. Both of those countries are saying it doesn't really matter what the law says. We want to get some cash to Ukraine and we found a way of doing it by linking bonds. So raising new money. So they're not actually taking money out of the Russian bank accounts. They're raising money from governments around the world. So it'll be fresh capital, but that those bonds will have a direct link to the frozen assets. And the only way that Russia would ever be able to get its money back would be by effectively giving large amounts of cash to Ukraine, which at this point in time looks very unlikely. I can't see President Putin agreeing to any of those sort of deals. And I definitely can't see him being comfortable with the idea of repaying bonds that Ukraine issued to fund its war against Russia. But it's an interesting idea that the USA and the UK have come up with. And what they're trying to do is realize the value of those frozen assets. They're obviously doing it in a slightly different way. They're not directly taking the cash out of the frozen accounts. But what they are doing is linking the new bonds directly to those frozen assets so that they've got some sort of recourse. And again, the legal implications of that are a minefield. I am sure Russia will be instructing all of their barristers right now to get on the case and start putting together some sort of plans to issue legal action if this does take place. But I think what we're seeing now is a change in the way that the West is approaching this war. Because the war is going on so long and is becoming so expensive and so much aid has already been provided to Ukraine, they need to unlock the value of these frozen assets. And the ideas that have been tabled so far go some way to doing that. It'll be interesting to see whether or not this actually gets approved and we start to see these bonds being issued. And if we do, if we saw a $50 billion bond being taken up and funded and $50 billion being given to Ukraine, then that could change the war in Ukraine materially. It could put Ukraine back onto the front foot and Russia onto the back foot. And it may well be another way that we could get an acceleration in terms of the peace talks. Because as it stands at the moment, Russia doesn't look like it wants to come to the table to agree a peace settlement. Something radical needs to happen. And these proposals go some way to getting there. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, you found it useful, informative and thought provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face. I've got some really exciting news for you. I've decided to give away another one of my statues. And this time, it's this guy, the man on stilts. 
Now, if you've been watching my channel, you'll know that this is one of the original pieces that I've been showing in the background for the last few years. This is a truly amazing piece. I absolutely love it. And it's made by a British artist called Paul Margetz, and he makes a limited number of each one of his pieces. And I've managed to secure a second one of these, but I'm giving this one away, which is the original one that I've had in the background for the last few years. And if you'd like to win it, you just need to buy a ticket in the raffle, which are priced at one pound each, which is around $1.30. So very affordable. So if you'd like to support the channel, rather than buying me a coffee or sending me a YouTube super thanks, why don't you buy a ticket in the raffle and you could have this in your home some point soon. Now, in terms of organizing this, I've got an independent company to collect the cash and make the draw for me. So I won't be choosing it. It will be entirely at random. And I will post this anywhere in the world to whoever wins it. There is a possibility that you may need to pay a little bit of import duty, depending on where you live and what the rules are. But I will send this anywhere. So if you'd like to win it, please buy a ticket in the raffle and good luck.